Um, so, so first, I, I want to just echo um, Dave in thanking uh, Dimitri and thanking really everyone here for making what's already been an extremely rewarding experience. Um, I should say, too, I, I remember when I was uh, still on, on uh, my philosophical mother's uh, knee and just sort of getting excited about philosophy, reading, um, reading Dan's book. And also, I lived in New York at the time, so I read the, the book review in the New York Times, which was outraged at the, at the um, title of his first book on consciousness, Consciousness Explained. And in a, a word of Yiddish that any New Yorker would understand, I think it was described as a, as a piece of chutzpah or chutzpahlish that it could uh, hope to explain consciousness, especially in, in these um, very materialist terms. And, uh, and a little later in my development, uh, when I was just uh, finishing my studies and, and Dave's book came around, um, it really, those two things were very seminal in my own um, uh, moving into, uh, into this area and, and, and moving into philosophy. Uh, and I've been, been inspired by both of them. And I want to also reiterate a, a remark that was made uh, by Paul in the last session, that anyone who's followed Dave's career or, or, or read his work closely uh, over the years will we'll know that uh, he is, A, trying to build a positive theory on the dualist side, but B, that he's a, s a very close reader of the science and takes these scientific claims seriously. And Dave has had the, the displeasure of having to serve as a commentator on my views on previous occasions. And he's never once said, oh, but zombies. They've never come up. It's never been, I'm not, I'm going to, I went to a graduate school in a place that hated naturalism and uh, hated cognitive science. And I would submit papers to my professors and my peers, and we had student uh, uh, sessions where you could present your work. And I was maddened by the fact that nobody ever addressed a single claim made in any of my papers. They never said an argument you made on page three or the evidence came out in section two. They always said either why is this philosophy or you've got to be wrong. We don't care what you said. You've got to be wrong because you're, you're a naturalist. So the, the, uh, the, the, one of the really wonderful things about Dave as a citizen of our field is he always addresses authors on their own terms. Um, I should say at the outset that with respect to choosing between phenomenological evidence or introspective evidence and, uh, and scientific evidence, um, I, I think that's a false dichotomy. We should not make such a choice. And we should not make, so, and this is very central, by the way, to those of you who recall Consciousness Explained, to the methodology that Dan calls heterophenomenology, that we should let all methods be relevant here. And I, I, I don't just think that's a kind of methodological um, dogma. I think it's actually a consequence of one's naturalism, that if the mental is, in some sense, part of the natural world, then introspective reports are as relevant as anything else. In fact, they're a part of evidence. They're part of observable behavior. But even from, from within, as we, as we consult our own experience, uh, we're consulting something that's perfectly natural, and that's, um, that's legitimate. But even more obviously, and I think more maybe it's less obvious, but, but, but um, a, a point that we, we mustn't forget is that the science in this area depends on the introspective reports. You cannot do this science without getting people to report what their experiences are like. I mean, there may be some special cases where you observe something other than reports, but a core part of the standard experiments that are done on consciousness involve consulting participants in these studies and asking them, what is it you see? When you talk to somebody who has a brain injury and say, can you still experience the visual world? And they say, no, it's that report and not just their behavior that matters. Um, so for instance, if they, if they reported that they, they can experience the visual world, but knock into every wall around them, um, that's, a, that's a tough case. Because then, then two kinds of behavior, verbal behavior and physical behavior, uh, come apart. And it's not clear what to say. But in the ordinary case, we take the, the first person reports very, very seriously. And we need to. So, um, so I think that we don't need to choose. But um, given this uh, availability of both kinds of evidence and the inseparability of of these two kinds of evidence. We can ask in my own case, and, and in the case of others like Ray Jackendoff, on whose shoulders I stand, and, and, and also, I, I should add, Dan, with the wonderful metaphor of the Friars Fringe, uh, how do we support an intermediate level view? How do we support the view that consciousness contains information that's restricted to a certain uh, perspectival or, or viewpoint um, a specific uh, level of representation? Now, at the outset, the idea that this is based entirely on introspection 
uh, is almost obviously false. Um, and almost obviously false because I think if you gave people the task of describing their experience, they wouldn't by default say, when looking at this glass, I see two vertical whitish lines uh, that are moving in near parallel. They would, they would instead say, I see a mug. So introspective reports, even from the first person point of view, are extremely at odds with an intermediate level perspective, at least at the first pass. And I think it's only through quite a lot of further probing that we arrive at the view that consciousness might be more restricted than we think. There are ways to do this in introspection. So introspection is psychologists, and also I should mention phenomenologists, have this notion um, uh, that we should bracket off uh, descriptions of experience that make reference to the content, the reference of experience, what in the world experience corresponds to. If we, if we bracket off, if we cut off a vocabulary that allows us to describe experience in terms of mugs and boats and cameras, we'll end up describing the world in terms of something like the intermediate level. Um, so the question is, is that bracketing uh, legit legitimate? Um, one thing that one needs to do immediately when confronted with the kind of um, content-based description we give on introspection is if you're going to defend the intermediate level view, you need to have a way of explaining the fact or explaining away the behavior of, explaining, of, of ascribing experience to oneself using categories like, like mug or cup or camera. And I, I think there are various lines of explanation there. One of them is that, as a matter of fact, we are at the intermediate level seeing a cup. That's what a cup looks like at the intermediate level. So these descriptions in terms of content are in some sense entirely accurate. Another thing is that verbalization is a product of a lot of processing that includes unconscious activity. So what somebody comes up with a report is a kind of translation from experience to another modality, to the linguistic uh, modality. And the information that's brought to bear in coming up with that report might, uh, might be <coughs> far richer than when we got an experience. So uh, we both have a legitima legitimization of the process of trying to bracket off this content-based vocabulary and an explanation of why content might be so natural, might come so readily uh, to, to people's minds when they try to describe experience. Now suppose you say you can't describe experience in terms of the object's identity, but instead need to uh, characterize what you're seeing. Or suppose instead you said, look, these things are both glasses. In English, we would call both of these things glasses. Is there a way in which these things are experientially alike? Can we isolate in an experience a commonality, a phenomenological commonality between them? And would that phenomenology be somehow categorical, or would it simply be in terms of features that they share at the intermediate level? And my guess is if you gave people the task of trying to characterize what makes these things alike, the characterization would be all intermediate level. They're transparent, they have ellipses at the surface, and so on. Um, so I do think that when you start to give people a more restricted set of, um, of requirements in characterizing experience, they would, through these reports, arrive at an intermediate level description. But it takes a lot of work to get there, and for ourselves. So I think it's an insight to oneself that experience is restricted to the intermediate level. It's quite shocking. We think about experience as giving us the world. We look at Paul, again, to use uh, this salient example, and we feel like we see Paul. So it's only after further interrogation where if somebody revealed, Paul has an identical twin, and they say, are you now seeing Paul? And he's on this boat. And Paul is lazy and likes to take naps periodically, so his twin kindly stands in for him. Are you sure you're experiencing Paul? And when you switch back and forth between, oh, maybe it's the twin, maybe it's Paul, is there a phenomenological difference? Is there a visual difference in those, uh, those shifts? And I think it's only when being probed with that further, more demanding question that we discover for ourselves in this quite shocking way that experience is restricted to shape and, uh, and color in the case of vision and other uh, the, of these uh, intermediate level features across the modalities. So are we relying on introspection? 
No, I think we're, we're in some sense where introspection systematically misleads. But introspection is always part of part of the evidence that we use, but we triangulate with other evidence. Now, just to come back to, to two things Dave said. Dave worries that the evidence from, from these brain injury cases, so we're talking about cases of associative agnosia, are not very strong. Um, that's the first worry. And, and I, I agree that there are ways in which if you rely on brain um, uh, evidence from injury, you'll get into various risks. Uh, first of all, we can't be assured that people with brain injuries process information the same way that everyone else does, and, um, and also um, in, in a certain way um, uh, brain injury evidence is, is unreliable because the, there might be downstream problems, problems with self-report and so on. But in this case, it's a different kind of case, and it fails on another empirical ground. This, the claim that I'm making about this place is that there's no difference in the phenomenology of somebody with associative agnosia, that is injury to high level vision, and somebody like us who has an intact visual stream. And from a scientific perspective, this is not very good evidence. It's what's called a null result. It would be trying to draw a strong conclusion by saying there's no difference between two populations. That might look like a, a, a problem. Um, so i just kind of trying to strengthen the, 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 um, the objection. Um, I actually think that when you look at associative agnosia, you do find all kinds of differences. So in first-person reports, people will say things like, um, they, they'll describe this in terms of two parallel lines or two converging lines and, and, um, and, and reflective surfaces, but they'll never arrive at the conclusion that it's a, it's a cup. Their experience is very painstaking. It takes them a long time to piece these things together. Even drawing the connections between two adjacent lines is effortful. If they quickly glance at a scene, they can't really parse objects into their, into their contours. So they see, you can imagine when you first glance at a cubist painting, and you see lots of lines, but you don't see which is the contour of a body or a face or a violin. It takes some very focused attention to put the pieces together. So agnosia is, in fact, pathological. And it's pathological in another way, which is that top-down information, categorical information, constantly informs vision. I, I don't believe that vision travels in one direction. And, and this was mentioned earlier in discussion. Uh, Paul mentioned that there are, there are often many more projections backwards. High level conceptual knowledge we know can travel into earliest levels of vision, maybe even into the retina, affecting the content of experience. So the intermediate level is not operating in some way that's cut off from what we, in, in the case of intact or healthy vision, can derive later on. So I certainly wouldn't want to hang my argument on the claim that somebody with high level visual damage sees the world just the way, way we do. Um, so in a way, um, the, the very modest claim derived from that, take, taking that work on its own, uh, would be something like this. As compared to destruction of the mid-level, which results in blindness, and the low level, which also results typically in, in blindness. Destruction of the high level seems to leave intact lots of things. These people will say they're having an experience. They'll characterize that experience in terms of color and line. If they raw, uh, do a drawing of their experience, it will look very similar to a drawing that you or I would produce. If they do a matching task where they say, are these two things alike in their form, they'll perform such a task successfully. So there's a lot intact. And I think if we, if we just take that much, we can at least arrive at the conclusion that high-level damage doesn't, um, doesn't eliminate experience completely. Does it contribute anything at all? Um, I think that's a harder question to address with that evidence alone. Um, the way you would address that question is more through a triangulation of different kinds of evidence, including introspective evidence at first-person report, uh, which I said in this case might, might mislead. Um, but another kind of evidence would be, say, um, uh, temporal evidence. So if you, if you look at the duration of an experience, um, you look at, at, at its, its time profile, how, say, say the duration of an after image, um, you might find beautiful correlations between what's going on in a mid-level and what people report and experience, um, but not so with the, with the high level. Or if you look at a disorganized experience that, that people can't classify um, and try and do the correlation, you'll again find beautiful correlation with the mid-level and not with the high level. Does the high level contribute anything at all? We already have an explanation for how the high level could contribute indirectly, because the high level through back projection can modify the mid-level. Does it contribute anything above and beyond those backwards projections? 
this is a question that I think is difficult to answer both through the empirical evidence and introspectively. So how do we settle it? One bit of evidence, and it's, it's not more than a bit of evidence, and this is introspective, is that in the intermediate level it seems like you could isolate and experience a particular component say the color or a line. You can focus on that. You can characterize that. You can match that across, um, across items. It's not clear we can ever bring into conscious awareness in some vivid, exportable, or repeatable way the, the contribution of the high level. So going back to our two glasses example, it's not clear that we can isolate an experience of just glasshood. Nor is it clear that if we, say, say you can have a case of agnosia where you have just the experience of shapes and colors, but no experience of categories, no experience of glasshood. If high levels contribute to phenomenology, we might expect the reverse of that, a double dissociation. Somebody who just experienced the high level glasshood, but couldn't look at shapes and colors. So you present them with two glasses, and you say, OK, what do you experience? Maybe the mid-level is damaged. And they say, oh, I'm just having this experience as of glasshood. I couldn't tell you if the glasses are straight or curved or wine glasses or, or, other, or stemless glasses. I just have this vivid phenomenology of glasshood. And that's not a pathology we find. So sometimes we can infer from a lack of evidence uh, support for a view uh, as much as we can from, from positive evidence. Um, I think, and I'll try, I'll try and stop now. I think that basically, and, and, and in, the, in the most modest way, I'd want to suggest that. Dave is in a certain way right. The status of the evidence here is far from demonstrative. I think anyone, not just people who work in a naturalistic way, but every philosopher should have enough humility to recognize that their views are always a work in progress. If you're a, a philosopher who works in an in a armchair way, you always know that somebody more clever than you or somebody who's studied your arguments closely will come around with a clever objection. That will demand a response that you didn't, you didn't really dot every I that first time around. You advance debate by giving an argument that others need to take seriously. And likewise, you need to take seriously their reply. With empirically based theories, all the more so, that we're constantly beholden to empirical evidence. I take the status of the mid-level hypothesis to be one that goes something like this. We have extraordinarily good evidence that the mid-level contributes to conscious experience. Eliminate any aspect of the mid-level, you eliminate the, the correlated part of experience. Beautiful matching studies, cell by cell matching studies, where we can show that not only is the content of a mid-level cell correlated with the content of experience, but the time course of the activity in that mid-level cell correlates with uh, experience. Uh, you can predict optical illusions and various distortions of visions by oddities of the neural dynamics at the mid-level. So beautiful matching studies. We have nothing closely approximating that for the high level. But what we do have, as Dave points out, is a clash of intuitions and far from demonstrative empirical evidence uh, that opens up a possibility that the high level might make some kind of contribution. The mid-level hypothesis is, is one that I think stands in a position of overwhelming conf confirmation of the truth of the mid-level underwhelming confirmation of a contribution of other levels. By comparison, the mid-level looks like it's the better confirmed theories than the others. But have the other theories been refuted? Has it been ruled out that other levels can't contribute to experience? I think we're not there yet. So you can think about that chapter, and you think about anything anyone in this room ever says as a work in progress, as a, as a hypothesis, as a research program that currently enjoys some evidence uh, that can be used uh, to direct future questions and future inquiry. And I think that's, uh, that's as best as I can do. Thank you.